All right, it's ticking up, so let's get started. Thank you guys for joining us at this virtual Boston Public Library program. My name is Laura. I am a teen librarian at the Central Branch at BPL, and my colleague Michelle, who works with me there, is down in the corner. And we are joined today by Namina Forna. She is the best-selling author of The Gilded Ones, which is a debut fantasy novel, the first in the series. It has already been optioned to film, and she's working on that screenplay as well as the rest of the series. So we are very excited to have her here with us. She's going to be talking to you guys a little bit about the book and her process, but we will also do a Q&A. So as it goes on, if you have questions, just drop them in that Q&A box below. Um, but with that, I will hand it over to Namina to get started. Hi, guys. Um, I First of all, I'm so excited because I hear there might be teens in the audience. Uh, so if you're here, please give me a shout because like I'm just excited to like talk to people. Uh, my name is Navina Forna. I am the author of The Gilded. Oh, I got to do it like that. The Gilded. I suck at this, you guys. The Gilded. Anyway, it's that book right there, the one behind my shoulder. Uh, I'm the author of The Gilded Ones. Um, and I'm just going to tell you guys a little bit about me, a little bit about um, how I created the book. Like, I want this to be really informal. Um, and I would love, love, love to have questions from you guys, especially if you have any questions about writing or even just about life, uh, because one of the things I'm going to talk about is failing a lot, which is what I did. All right, um, so first of all, to tell you a little bit about myself, um, I was born and raised in Sierra Leone, West Africa. I came to America when I was nine. Um, I came to Georgia and uh, I went to Spelman College uh, for undergrad and I was an English major and I started writing at Spelman. I started uh, writing, like I decided to become an author at 19. And of course I like wrote my first book at 19 and it sucked a lot. You will never see it ever. No one ever will. It has disappeared forever um, into the ether. Um, but I uh, I got the inklings of the Gilded Ones while I was at Spellman because um, when I was at Spellman, I basically I had a lot of questions about what it meant to be a woman. Um, when I grew up, like I grew up in Sierra Leone during the Sierra Leonean Civil War, um, and I don't know if anybody's like ever heard of it, but it like lasted a decade. Um, there were a lot of atrocities, and a lot, and like some of the most brutal atrocities seemed to be saved for women. So I sort of always grew up like knowing that like um, my body was under threat. And I grew up knowing that I grew up new. Was I just about to say newing? I grew up knowing um, that like I wasn't considered equal to men. Um, and when I came to America, I was like, you know, this is America. Everything's gonna be like better, you know, because yay, gender equality, blah blah blah. And it wasn't because like in Georgia there was like purity culture, and I like and I remember like looking at my classmates who'd like go to these balls like where they present like you know they'd have virginity rings and like present their fathers a promise of i will be a virgin for however and i was just like how is this like different from sierra leone it's like y'all are being like a little bit nicer about things but it's all sort of like on the same spectrum so i had all these questions um and i felt really bad for like um having these questions, I thought there was something wrong with me um, that I could not, you know, sort of fit into the status quo, whatever country I was in. But then I go to Spelman and I start taking women's studies classes and I realize, wait a minute, this is a great bamboozlement. Like I have been bamboozled. Like all of this stuff is made up, you know? And like at the time I started having a, a recurring dream and it was of this girl, she's like wearing golden armor and she's walking slow motion onto a battlefield, like swords in hand. She looks like she's about to kick butt. And uh, I was like, I don't know who she is, but she's like really, really cool. And I wanna know what her story is. So then fast forward, um, I go to film school because of course I couldn't, I, I, I try to sell a couple of books. I, I tr Well, I tried to get an agent and I couldn't because like, 
um, around the time that I first started writing, number one, I sucked. Well, no, I didn't suck, but like, you know, it takes you, it takes you time to become a good writer. But I think the other thing that was sort of against me um, was back in the day, people would literally say, and this was acceptable in the industry, that Black people don't sell books. And you um, especially don't sell books uh, with uh, um, Black people on the cover. Um, and so I went to film school because I was like, you know, this novel thing might be a pipe dream. So let me go to film school and like see if I can, um, see if I can find another career to do while I'm trying to do this novel thing. Um, nobody told me that film, film, film is another pipe dream. I didn't, I didn't realize, I don't know what I was thinking, but like um, while I was there um, in 2012, uh, I was sitting in class when the words sort of just dropped into my head and I'll never forget them. I was nine years old when first I learned I could not die. Um, and that became, was what became the Gilded Ones. So I spent like half a year researching and then the other half of the year writing the book. And I was so excited because I was like, finally, you know, my craft and everything is equal. Like I have training, I'm ready. It's time for me to go out and sell this book. It is my time. And it was like the time of like hashtag girl boss, girl power, all this stuff. So I was like, it is time. This book is topical. Like there's no way. Um, and so I like send it out. And of course, what do I get back? Um, this is, you know, it's a really cool concept, but does she have to be, you know, black? Like, um, I got that back <laughs> um, with the revise and resubmit, um, which is what like agents will send you, like if they like something, but they need you to change something. And I remember, so like when you graduate from film school, cause I went to USC film school, Trojans. Um, and when you graduate from film school and you do the writing track um, of the film MFA, you have like this, you have like this sort of uh, presentation thing where like you get to submit to your portfolio and like all these agents um, and managers who are like, like agents, except they can't sell things. They have to like go through anyway. So all these people come out and they're like uh, ready to sell you, like they're ready to like hear from you, see if they want your stuff. And so I was all excited because like I had this amazing portfolio. I'm like, I am the best. You know, my writing is sparkling. I am the best, like I'm ready. Uh, you couldn't tell me anything at that time, uh, but I really was the best, I'm not even gonna lie. And so like, while I'm there, this, uh, I'll never forget this one manager, um, no, this one agent from like a really top uh, company that I had been so excited about, like sits, and he was like the one meeting that I wanted to meet. Um, he sits, sits in front of me and he's just like, you know, like, he's like, your stuff is really good, but like, you're never going to sell it. Like, there's no room in the industry for like the stuff that you write. Nobody wants like this black stuff. That's what he said to my face. Um, and it was so painful because like, here I am, I've done like everything to get this dream together. And somebody is telling me like, literally not even caring that. You know, they're just like, matter of fact, it's never going to happen. And so, of course, I got depressed, um, but I still kept going because for me, the reason why I wanted to write was um, growing up during a war, like books and particularly for me, fantasy books were safe spaces, you know, like it's it for me, a book is a warm hug, you know, like no matter what's happening outside you can always disappear into a book and like be comforted and feel secure in that book and that's what i wanted to give to other people so it was never a question of me stopping although like every at this point everyone was like you need to stop um go to law school and i, I applied to law school got in and never went which is another thing but finally um after all this struggling um I finally get an agent in 2016. And then uh, we go out with the book and it doesn't sell. And I'm like, at this point I have like a full-time day job, which I hate, like you should never put me in an office, in an office, like just, I'm not a good office person. It just it doesn't work out. And so I was like, at this point, like really desperate. <laughs> and uh, um, I started seeing promos for Black Panther um, cause I was writing clickbait. It was my job to see trends. 
And so I see like how people are reacting to Black Panther. And I was like, oh my gosh, the time is now. Like either I sell the Gilded once now or I never sell. So I like tell my agent, I'm like, hey, um, I have this book. It requires a page one rewrite. Cause like what I wrote, like it was a different time. Like my writing has improved. Like also I didn't go as hard, blah, blah. She's like, okay, write it. Like how long do you need? I'm like, give me two months. I get it to her in a month and a half. And the day that it goes out, is the day that it sells and i am over the moon i'm so excited um but that is my journey and that is the journey of the gilded ones um and uh, i wanted to really quickly switch gears because like in writing the gilded ones when i was writing it there was no african based fantasy worlds um, there were no African-based fantasy worlds. Like that wasn't a thing in 2012. Who was writing that? And like when you wrote, like when I told people about the stuff that I wanted to do, they, they were like, oh, you're a hotel. You know, like, you guys know what a hotel is? Y'all know what a hotel is? Okay, cool. Um, and I was like, whatever. I think this is amazing because like when I grew up in Sierra Leone, like one of the things that my dad would do to like distract me from what was going on, he would tell me what I thought were stories, but turns out what were true histories um, of like ancient African civilizations. And so as I was writing the book, I had to go back um, and do my research. So I like, remember I told you I researched for like half a year and finding what ancient Africa looked like is super difficult because first of all, like a lot of that history has been overwritten and it has been overwritten um, on purpose, right? So like, I'll give you an example. In the Gilded Ones, um, the walls of, like the capital city is called Himaira. And there are these walls surrounding it that like, you know, extend up into the sky and it's amazing. Those are actually based um, on the walls of Benin in what is now Nigeria. Um, and the walls of Benin were at one point four times the size of the Great Wall of China. Um, I believe they're the largest uh, archaeological construction ever. Um, like, basically, these things, I think they could circle England like 16 times, and the Great Britain like 16 times. Have you guys ever heard of that? Michelle? Laura? See what I'm saying? This is actual true history but nobody knows about this because the, the overwhelming idea of Africa is that we were primitive people walking around naked. And which is funny because like when I try to think of the world of the Gilded Ones, like the first thing I thought about was, you know, naked people in huts, which is funny because like I'm from Freetown, I'm from the capital city. Like I lived in a nice house, but like that's how my mind was. And so I had to do this process where I had to go through and number one, like create a Pinterest bar board and find like pictures of all these places just to sort of, you know, affirm in my mind that these things were true, that this does exist, you know, um, before I could go and write my book. So I went and I looked at all these um, ancient African civilizations um and uh, i you know there were certain things that i loved like for instance um the ruins of great zimbabwe um which uh are these ruins like in the middle of zimbabwe that like when the europeans came they were like they told the native tribe they were like yo um i i forgot what the word for ancient what, I forgot what the name of the ancient Lebanese were, but they were like, the, the, they traveled across the Horn of Africa, came here, and then they made that, and you guys didn't make that, make that which, you know. Um, but so these were sort of the things that I had to like, sort of look at and process before I could go and write this book, because like, there was nothing like it um, there for me to like, um, sort of scaffold off of. But now, like, there's so many um, other African-based uh, fantasy books. And I'm, like, so happy and so grateful because that means that now um, anybody who wants to write that doesn't have to do that struggle of imagination that I did in creating this world. Um, because there's a lot of us now who have already made it okay for the minds to open and for the imagination um, to flow. Um, 
so with that, um, I think I've gone, like I've talked a lot. I can be very long winded, but now I'm gonna like let people ask me questions. Um, I'm so excited to hear whatever questions you may have. Thanks so much, Namina. That was really great. Loved hearing all about that. Um, I guess we'll start with the first question. Um, so you talked a little bit about growing up in Sierra Leone. Um, how much inspiration do you draw from your own like childhood for the story, as long as culture and mythology, and then how much was just things that you made up? Mm. So in and during in the book, there's the ritual of purity. Um, I didn't really base, um, I think like sort of because I have like a general knowledge, I didn't base um, things in the book on any specific thing. Um, although I will say that in terms of the language system and in terms of the naming of things, like, so I'm Timney, that's my tribe uh, in Sierra Leone. So like when I was creating words, I went back and I used the Timney dictionary because sadly I can't speak Timney. Nobody like taught me, which by the way, I feel some type of way about because like I should know Timney and I don't, but it is what it is. Um, so I use that as a basis or like the word alaki, uh, which are the girls in my book that bleed gold and are faster and stronger. Um, that is actually a very common word um, that's used in Sierra Leone. Um, I think it's um, Arabic in origin. Um, but like, it really does mean useless. Like people will use it like jokingly. They'll be like, um, they'll be like, ah, no, mix me pandi salaki business. Or like they'll um, use it seriously. Like if something, like if somebody's mad and they say that you're alaki, they mean they are like really mad. They're like, you, you alaki posse. Like that's what, like when your parents are like, you, can I ask for you alaki person? Like, you know, you've done something wrong. So like, that's like a real world. Um, that's like a real word. The other thing is like, so with the ritual of purity, um, I actually based that off of, in Sierra Leone, we have uh, a secret society called uh, Bondo, which forces uh, uh, F female genital mutilation, FGM, um, on girls and women um, in the country. Um, about 90% of girls in Sierra Leone have had this done to them. It's like a really horrifying um, statistic and like, to me, what's even more, and, and this is, I think, one of the things that really got me to write The Gilded Ones is my grandmother wanted this for me. Thankfully, my parents were like over my dead body. But like, because in her mind, and, and it wasn't like she, it wasn't like she was, um, you know, evil or anything like that. In her mind, this was what was necessary for me to become a pure woman, right? So she's like, you know, we go send Namina, go like we're gonna send Namina, like and the and, and my parents were like, ah, no, you won't. Um, but what was fascinating to me is that she wanted this for me because she loved me, and it's the same thing with like the ritual of purity and all these things in the book. Is like when individual people do it, it's like it's not necessarily out of an evil intent the evil is built into the structure and the system around it. Um, so yeah, so those are, yeah, ritual and traditions. So on a lighter note, we had a couple people asking, do you have the whole story for the whole series plotted out or have you kind of left it a little bit open to see where it takes you or has it changed at all as you've rewritten? Um, it has changed a little bit, but I do, I do sort of like have a general arc. Um, I have a beginning and an end and a, a good chunk of the middle. Like I've already finished book two. Um, I'm about to do my final rewrite of it. Um, so like, we're almost there. Um, now it's like figuring out book three, because like initially when I started, I had a very clear idea of what the ending was. And now the ending is not so clear, um, but we're gonna get there. Um, but I do know sort of like what the, what I wanna examine. Cause for me with each book, like I wanna examine a certain thesis. So like in book one, it's what happens when you live in a patriarchy. Um, and I'll tell you guys about the thesis of book two when it's, I don't wanna spoil it, but like, yeah, we're just gonna move on. 
Um, there's a couple of questions about the cover of the book, which is gorgeous. Um, and so people want to know, did you have any input on the cover? Um, what was the like process of getting that artwork done? And did you have to fight to have a black girl on the cover of the book? Um, no, I did not. Um, I did not have to fight and I'm so grateful for that because like for me, every like, man, when I tell y'all the first time I looked at this cover, I cried um, because initially when I started writing the book, it was very difficult to find a fantasy image of a black girl um, and especially one that was cute. And so to find this one, it was just the most amazing thing. Um, the process was, uh, so this is basically the second cover that we had. The first one, like, cause I had an idea. I thought like initially the Gilded Ones was called Deathless, um, which I can never pronounce that word properly, Deathless. Um, and so like, I, you know, I had like an idea that it was going to be like sort of this ominous cover, black and gold, you know, maybe blood dripping or whatever, because, you know, um, and we did a cover like that and it didn't work out. Um, so then uh, my editor was just like, uh, my editor, Kelsey Horton, she's just like, now I'm gonna, I know that I, I, I follow this artist um, on Instagram. He's amazing. I think he can do an amazing cover. And I, um, and I like, and, it, and by the way, his name is Johnny Tarajosu. You can follow him on Instagram. He's an, he's amazing. But I looked at the stuff and I was like, mm, 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 I'm not sure. Blah, 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 blah. Because you know, like you would like, I didn't know what I was talking about. Like I was foolish. I didn't know. Um, so he goes off and he does this cover and they bring it to me. And I'm like, whoa, you know, like it, it, there was no other reaction. Cause like literally the only input that I had was there was like maybe this one thing that looked like a zipper on her, on her dress. And that was it. And I was like, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah you know, maybe fix that. But otherwise I had no notes. Like it was beautiful. And the reason why I love this cover so much is because, um, I had forgotten like that, like all these girls that they were so young, um, that they were so young and so innocent. And like this cover just sort of really reflects that. Yeah, it's such a good cover. Um, so the next one is just about writing a fantasy novel and with all the world building and details that go into that, especially in a series, how do you keep everything straight as you're writing this? I honestly do not know. I'm not even gonna lie to you. I feel like there's um, some authors who like have like very detailed notes and blah, 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 blah. Um, I would like, to, I would love to be like, yeah, I really know. I go back and I like read book one very reluctantly, I might add, because I don't like to like look at my work after I'm done with it, just to like be like, oh yeah, da, da, da. or like sometimes I'll like ask my cousin because she she reads and is voracious um, and has like knows the Gilded Ones. I'd be like, like, so tell me what happened here. And she'd be like, oh. I'm like, oh yeah. And then I continue. <laughs> so that's how it works out. Um, I'm sorry, you guys, I sort of suck when it comes to that. Um, oh, that's, that's great. Uh, it's honest. Um, so this is actually a great question because I also listen to the audiobook and it is so great and it really like really immerses you in the world. And so did you, the narrator, the narrator of the audiobook um, is amazing. Do you know her personally? Did you have any um, like input in the audiobook, especially since it has so much of like different language in it? What was that like? So with the audiobook, um, I did choose the narrator because I was very firm in that I wanted a black woman. And like, I was all like, you know, I want somebody with an accent because Baker is like pseudo British type person. Um, but like her voice was just like butter. I remember re like listening to it and be like, oh yeah, that's her. Um, and so basically like I gave her um, pronunciation notes um, and then I gave her, hey, this person should sound like this. And she just did all the rest and she's amazing. And her name is Shana Small, she's amazing. Follow her. Awesome. Um, so next one we've got is, 
Considering your background in screenwriting, did you always know that you would want this story to exist in both mediums? Oh, definitely. Um, so for me, I've always been the type of writer who's like, I want to create franchises. Like, I, and that's because like all of my stuff always translates, you know? If it like if it's a book, then it can be a movie, then it can be a video game, then it can be and like that's just like how my mind works. Like I've never wanted to be like hmm, how to say this? Like I've always wanted to be the type of writer that like like my stuff is easily consumable. You know what I mean? Like I've never wanted to be a coffee table book. I've wanted to be a book like where like the highest honor for me is like somebody comes to me with a book that is water stained and like folded at the edges and like, you know, like that sort of like a loved, that's what I've always wanted. And so like, those are the type of books that I try to create. Yeah. Um, so this one, do you have, how do you stay motivated as you were writing The Gilded Ones? Did you read any books or watch any shows to keep your imagination and creativity flowing? Um, all right, so uh, this is a really great question because it's like one of the things of process. Like, so for me, um, when I'm writing in a genre, I don't read that genre. So if I'm writing like, um, if I'm writing fantasy um, and specifically African fantasy, I will not read anything else like it. Um, and that's just because I'm always cautious of having other people's words or their um, ideas in my head as I'm creating my own world. That being said, what I do is um, I like to I like to cross mediums. So like if I'm writing like a book that's in if I'm writing like say I was writing the gilded like with the gilded ones, um, my touchstones were 300 and Spartacus Blood and Sand. That's what I was, and also um, eventually Attack on Titan. Cause like initially when I had the idea, those were the things that I was like watching. Um, and then fast forward to like, when I was doing the rewrite, I was watching Attack on Titan. So like, and you can like literally see it in sort of like the violence of the book and like also how it ramps up because those were my touchstones in terms of like, how do you craft something? So like, I like to do multiple mediums. Um, to spur my imagination. Um, so this next one might be tricky because I know as soon as you ask someone about books or movies or something, your mind just goes blank. But they want to know what are a couple of your books that a couple books that you've read as an adult that you wish you had when you were younger. Oh, I got you. Um, so The Black Kids by Christina Hammonds Reed, uh, Legend Born by Tracy Dion, A Ray Bearer by Jordan Efueco, A Sword of Rates, A Song of Rates and Ro Ruin by um, Rosette. I, I, I always want to say Rosie, but her actual name is Roseanne Brown. Um, let's see, what else? Let me look at my library. Um, I loved those. Um, I loved, oh, This Is My America, Kim Johnson. Like all of these books, like when I was growing up, I never saw myself in any books. And like what that does um, is that when you only read white people, like all you can imagine is white people. And so I had to do a process um, in my late teens of, and early twenties of having to like recenter myself um, in my own mind because all the stuff that I read and I watched told me that I wasn't worthy of being um, of being a hero in my own right. And so now I have all of these books and I'm so excited for you guys because you guys have all of these books and it's like amazing. Ooh, another book that you guys should look out for, or let me tell you, let me, let me put y'all up on game. All right, so three books to look out for uh, coming later this year. One is Skin of the, T C Skin of the Sea by Tasha. I don't know what her last name is. It's very sad, I should ask. Um, the second one is Ace of Spades by uh, Farida. I'm not even going to try to pronounce her last name. It's just my baby boo Farida. Um, and then the um, and then the third one is Bad Witch Burning, which I literally just read, and that shook me. Um, and yeah, 
So these are the, these are like my recommendations for watch out for these three books because I've read all of them from like like from when they started writing them to when they finished uh, when they finished edits and they're all gorgeous books, um, hundred percent. So I'm writing those down. That sound those sound great. Um, I'm so excited for Ace of Spades. So I'm gonna yeah, give that another I, shout out. I read about that one, so I'm excited to read it. Um, so this question um, is saying that you talked earlier about the um, the difficult things that were happening um, in your country when you were growing up. Um, how important it is, is it to highlight traditions of one's country regardless of subject matter? That's a really difficult question because the way that I feel about it is traditions are what you make them, right? Like we choose what traditions we have, you know? And this for me, like growing up in Sierra Leone, one of the things, um, and just in like basically in any society that is either patriarchal or narcissistic and or like people will always be like tradition, 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 but we make tradition. Um, so for me, I love to highlight the beautiful parts of my tradition. Like for instance, in the Gilded Ones, um, all the girls are forced to wear masks. Now this is ostensibly a bad, like, you know, um, at first it's a bad thing, but then we, we have more talk about it in book two. Like, so, you know, we have different ideas about the masks, but Sierra Leonean culture is a mask culture. Um, at every, at every occasion, we have these masquerade dancers and they wear the masks and like all the beautiful like costumes or whatever. So like, I wanted a world where that, that was, where that was, uh, front and center, and we could see people wearing all these different um, and beautiful African masks. So really, like, on one hand, I was using it to demonstrate something, but on another hand, I really like masks. Ooh, let me show you all something. This, I had this made by, like, uh, one of the carvers of the masks in Black Panther, and it's a war mask. Whoa! That's awesome. Yeah. So I really love masks. I have tons and tons and tons of African masks everywhere. Um, that so is cool. so cool. Yeah. <laughs> like I lost, uh, I lost the question, but I'm back now. <laughs> um, so this makes sense for uh, Nicole She's looking at schools. Um, why did you choose Spelman College for undergrad? Oh, I'm the perfect person to ask this question. <laughs> yes. Oh, I got to pitch Spellman. All right, my child, listen well. So I was valedictorian of my high school, had like a perfect score on like SAT verbal. We won't talk about the math, but it was really good. I was all around like a nerd, um, a really, really good student. And I was all like, I'm going to go to Harvard. That was all through like all through my whatever, I was like, I'm going to go to Harvard. And my sister, my sister, as I am saying to you, she said to me, she's like, come here, my child. There's a place called Spelman. It's right down the street. We're going to go there for homecoming. And I was like, blah, 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 blah. I don't want to go. Whatever. You don't know anything. She's like, okay, fine. So we go to Spelman for homecoming. And like, when I tell you guys, like the clouds parted and like there was sunlight and it was just it was amazing because like I had never seen before such beautiful, well put together, well spoken black women, all of them in the same place. And remember, I'm like a nerd. When I say like I'm a nerd, like I was just, I was one of like those teens that you sort of want to bully. Like I really was, I was very bullyable, you know? Um, and when I went to, like, and I, when I saw Spellman, I was like, you know what? I could go to any Ivy League, but if I go, I won't be like them. Um, and that's what I wanted um, because I knew like, you know, you can learn, like you can have an amazing education anywhere, but like at Spelman, not only did I have an amazing education and I'll point out two things. Like the first one was like African diaspora in the world, which is basically in your uh, first, in your very first semester, 
um, you basically learn all this stuff that they don't teach you in school. Like that's like real history and stuff like that, that now there's people are starting to teach you. I learned all of that at Spelman. So like it is required for you to like learn that or whatever. Um, it's also required for you to like sort of learn how to speak in public and like all of these things. So like basically for me, um, Spellman crafted a whole person and not just a smart person. And that's why I went. Also, they gave me a full ride, which is very important. So going off that and kind of speaking directly to the teens, we have someone who wants to know what your advice would be for a teen who wants to be a writer or wants to start working on a novel. The first thing I will say is read everything you can in the genre. In order for you to be um, excellent at a genre, you must know everything that's out there. Like um, when I was like, when I was a teen up until the day, up until I was 24, I would read at least eight books a week, every single week. You don't have to do that, but you do have to know your genre backwards and forwards. So like um, other things that I would point out to you that like sort of help you become genre savvy and are just helpful for writing, um, tvtropes.com. Like I just go, I spend a lot of time on there just like sitting and reading the tropes of like, okay, if this, in this book, this blah, 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 blah. So this looks like this, this is what usually happens. Just sort of learning the rhythms of certain types of stories. I would also read books like Save the Cat um, because that gives you um, an idea of what structure looks like because that's the one thing where people tend to fail is structure. Like, here's the thing, I think like, when you're a writer, everything is sort of instinctual when you start, but you have to, you have to take time to sort of understand the craft of writing. So you have to put in that work. And like the bit, one of the biggest thing I will say to you is like, understand that you will suck probably for a long time. And that's fine, right? Like failure is fine. Um, it is, it, it, it is just part of, it's just part of life. Like, look at me, like I failed forever and a day like I was a failure forever and a day and that's fine you know because eventually because for each failure you learn and you get better um and your writing just grows and grows and grows um so I would say like also make it a practice to like write as much as you can people say write every day that's actually not um good for your mental health so watch your mental health that's the other thing is because here's the thing like you have like Oh, this is important. If you want to be a writer, you have to like understand that um, that rejection is the name of the game. Um, and and it's fine. You will get rejected hundreds of times. Like one thing that I always say to people is like, hold out for a thousand rejections, right? Like count your rejections, hold them with as a badge of honor because you know, I have gotten this rejection, which means it's out of the way which means that I'm closer to my goal. So just use your rejections as a badge of honor because they remind you that you tried um, and that you're just, you're one step closer. So yeah, that's the advice that I have. I could go on forever, but I'm gonna stop. <laughs> that was excellent advice. Thank you so much. Um, so you talked a little bit about this, but um, are there any other genres that you're interested in writing or is fantasy where you'd like to stay? Um, so I definitely want to write horror. Like I want, I have at least one good horror under my belt. I think, you know, like just like, I, I, I think so. And then I would like to write some, like, I definitely want to do like a magical realism type, uh, thing about like my family history. Cause we are, we are interesting people. Um, and I don't see like, I know everyone thinks their family is interesting, but like just the stuff that we, anyway, so I'd like to do at least one story, um, like that, but I'm mainly a fantasy person. I'm not going to lie to you. Fantasy all day, every day. And like young adult and middle grade, like, I don't really, you know, there are other genres, but why, why, why go away from like a full feast? You know what I mean? I'd love to read your middle grade fantasy. I feel like you would kill that. that I, was I, I love middle grade. It is definitely my thing. Right. And I would love to read your horror. 
very sounds very good i thought you did a really good job of like depicting the monsters that i won't give the full spoilers on so i think that would be very cool um kind of going back to you mentioned tv tropes briefly before so we have a question here about the bug that's a little bit of a spoiler so cover your ears if you haven't finished it yet um but it seems kind of early on like there's going to be a love triangle and then that's kind of flipped on its head and doesn't really come to fruition was that a trope that you purposely didn't want to have fully play out in your story i don't like love triangles i really don't like i and you know what it is like i'm a simple person i'm just like here that person good what you know like i know there's some people who like love the angst and the but it's just and also like an odd the more honest um reason is because for me the romance in the gilded ones is incidental it's not the the actual romance for me in the gilded ones is the platonic love story um and it, and that is what it will remain across the entire thing is because i think so often we're taught that like we must look out for the it's the two people um of opposite and same gender who are sexually attracted to each other and come together and i'm like no nah, but but like you know friendship is also valid you know like it's you know like people you like friendships are also love affairs because like when you have friends it is falling in love you fall in love with someone and then you choose over it in your interactions to continue that love and i think sometimes people like and i think a lot of times we forget that because the whole emphasis is always it must lead to romance I love that because we so often have teens come in that are looking for fantasy but want fantasy without a like romance plot that overtakes it. So it's really nice to hear that that will continue because I know they're looking for that. They really are. Um, so you said uh, we saw that the Gilded Ones is going to be made into a movie, and you're involved in the script side of that. What has that been like? I, it is difficult. I'm not gonna lie to you, um, because like, so it was difficult. Uh, it, it's it's very difficult to switch from one brain to another, right? Because like, movie brain is like has everything has to be distilled down to this is what it is. Book brain is like you can go off on tangents. Like it can be beautiful and you know and poetic and blah blah. You'll get there in the end, and that's fine. These two things are sometimes incompatible, but I think that um, both help each other because I'm definitely a better writer, uh, novelist because I, because I'm a screenwriter and I'm definitely a better screenwriter because I'm a novelist. Like I'll tell y'all, man, like I first started off like really trying to be a novelist and I was very long winded. I mean, I'm long winded in general. It is what it is, you know, like my family makes fun of me. It's, it, it, you know, um, but in in writing like br like bro i would <laughs> the descriptions that i used to do like would boggle the mind and now i no longer do that because i'm a screenwriter and people like will get offended and be like what what are you doing like save space for like other people you know cuz a screenplay is like a blueprint so uh, going off of that, someone wants to know if you have any dream castings for the movie. Ooh, um, so before I did it, but like the more that I think about it. All right. So, all right. Um, I think definitely the Emperor Idris Elba. Idris, like, please, Idris, be the Emperor. Like, who else? Who else? I just wanted to see like him like decked out in gold wearing like, you know, all the like rings and stuff. Like, just he Idris. Okay. So, um, and for uh, Deka, like, so um, there is this Netflix film called Cuties, um, which everybody like, you know, was in an uproar about, even though like, it's actually a really good movie that has a really good point and it's not what it seemed like. Um, but the main character of that, um, I forget what her name is, the actress who plays the main character. She's like really pretty, dark skinned, like gorgeous. I think she'd be a great Deka. Now I'm not sure because uh, she's francophone. I'm not sure if she can speak English, but like just that general look, I I love. 
Um, and then for Britta, like the one person I've always known is Britta. Cause like y'all watch Dairy Girls. Um, what's her name from Dairy Girls, but also from Brid Bridgerton. Um, Nicola Coughlin. She's yeah. yes. Yeah. yeah. She is Britta all the way. The minute I saw her on Dairy Girls, I was like her, 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 that's Britta. Um, so that, that's it for me. But like, I am, I am open to being pleasantly surprised by whomever, because again, you know, it's a young cast. I assume that they would be unknown. So yeah. Um, when I was listening to the audiobook, the, uh, she also came to mind because of the accent of the yeah. girl in the audiobook. So that's, yes. that's really funny. Um, we have, all right. What are the differences between you? Uh, you kind of answered this one. Um, what was the first book you sent out for publishing or have you tried other books before this? Oh yeah. Um, so like, I know it's the thing that writers are like, this was my first book. And I tried on first try and it was beautiful because you know, I'm such a genius and I yeah, know like, listen, man, like I, <laughs> the Gilded Ones is actually my sixth book that I've written. Um, right. Um, and my first two books sucked. The rest of them were, were great. I'm not even gonna lie. They were great. And I'm going to try and sell them again, but like my first two, Man, we will never, we will never talk about them. They will burn. Um, well, I do have one copy of it each. Like maybe one day, like when I'm like dead, everyone can read it and laugh and it'll be great. Um, but yeah. Um, so the moral of the story is it takes a while. Um, people who are like, this is my first book, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, you've had like, you've probably been writing like 20 billion short stories before. Um, nobody like comes out the womb good. It just, it doesn't work out that way. Uh, we have a couple questions about the publication of this being pushed back a little, I assume because of COVID and then just like what it has been like publishing and promoting a book in this very bizarre year. I call it the pandemic industrial complex. Uh, 2020, 2021 to me is all the same. Um, uh, I was going to, okay. So um, when COVID happened. Remember when we were all like, oh, it's going to be two weeks and it's going to blow over, right? And then it wasn't two weeks and it didn't blow over. Like, so I got a very uh, nice little call from like my agent who's like, Namina, I have some news. We have decided to push the book back a year. And she's like, and, and Alice is British. So everything that she says sounds very nice. But like, y'all should have seen me like, I was super dramatic. Like, I was like, woe is me. Like, oh my, because like, for me, this was like the like the the apex of my life, you know, because I tried for so many years. It took me 12 years just to get an agent, right? So like now, like I was like, COVID happened because the universe doesn't want me to publish a book. Like literally, y'all, it, it was very shameful and very embarrassing. But um, I was very, very sad. I moped around for like at least a couple of weeks. Um, but like, honestly, it was the best decision. I'm so grateful that my, uh, that my publisher did that because, uh, the 2020, as you all saw was, it was, yeah. And like, we had to try to figure out how to like, um, sort of maneuver in this new reality, which none of us knew, you know what I mean? So like, I'm, I'm very grateful that they did that. It took us a while to figure out our, um, to find our footing, but we did. And like, I'm really happy with how everything turned out. And I actually think it was for the best. So, but y'all should have seen me. It was, it was very shameful. I'm a grown woman. I shouldn't be like that. Um, our next question is uh, a lot of fantasy series fall into the cliffhanger trope which can be really frustrating. Uh, did you make a conscious effort to end the Gilded Ones in the way that wraps up the story in book one, but also like leaves a clear path yeah, for I hate book that. two? I hate that. Like, listen, like, man, any time, like I got furious when books end in, like, especially book one, like I understand book two because like, you know, oftentimes book two, like you sort of don't really have a choice, but on book one, like really, you couldn't find a way, like, okay, I have, such thoughts about that i really despise it i really do it really like it grinds my every gear 
like for a book to hang on a cliffhanger in book one. I just like, I'm just like, it, 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 it infuriates me on a deep and visceral level. Like there's two things that make me mad. Like when people mess with my food, cause I'm a foodie. And when people give me a cliffhanger, like those two things will have me like, just being like, I don't even know why they did that, man. Like that was just not cool. Like I, yeah. All right. I let it go. Okay. I think we're on fully the same page 100%. as that, so yeah. we feel you. Um, we have a couple questions about more specific writing advice. Um, so one, just specific tips for writing fantasy, and then also tips for moving between different age groups of writing and how you manage that. Oh, okay. So you're probably going to have to remind me of the second question, but all right. Like, so hmm, specific tips for writing fantasy, let's talk world building. So with, okay, no, no, let's start here. So with fantasy, one of the things, one of the easiest ways to like get tripped up is with description, um, and with creating, um, and with creating new terms and tr things or whatever. Right. So one of the things that I do, and you'll notice, um, I, it's very rare that I um, introduce more than one or two uh, new names, words, or concepts per, 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 per chapter. And that is because the easiest way to get somebody to turn away is when you are like, and Thranduil of the whatever, of the, of the Elven South, duh, duh, duh. Like, like, you know, people's minds will explode because there's only so much that we can grasp at a time. So like when you are, when you are uh, putting in that detail of the world, be sparing, right? So like one a new, like if it's a new name or a new concept, like one at a time, one per, one per chapter and let it build on each other. Because if not, like if you start introducing all kinds of new names, like whatever, it, it gets really, um, it gets really confusing and gets really off-putting fast. It's also the reason why, um, I like, I, you will notice I specifically, um, try to make sure that names, um, and things are like simple for people to understand and keep pushing because when you are introducing people into a new world, you have to like really give them like a soft landing and then you hit them over the head with it but you have to like really sort of slowly introduce them. Um, the second thing is that um, in terms of descriptions, like don't describe everything, right? Like I like to say um, you go 80% of the way and leave 20% for the uh, audience to fill in. Cause like writing is a conversation between you um, and your and your reader, right? And they and they have to have active participation. So their minds have to have the space to be able to imagine. And they can't if you like literally describe everything down to like the pinky finger. You know what I mean? Like so, give leave space for your reader. The other thing that I will say um, <clears throat> is if you want to learn how to world build, one of my favorite um, tools um, recently that I've watched is Netflix's Alien Worlds. Because in the, in the, it's like a speculative documentary and it's like four, uh, it's, it's four episodes, so it's easily consumable. But what you will see in that documentary is like, first um, they have like a natural phenomenon that they're ex examining in Earth, on Earth. And then they use what they've learned to create what an alien world looks like using these principles. And the reason why I bring this up is the most believable fantasy has a basis of reality. So like, for instance, when I was creating the Gilded Ones, I did my research on what ancient Africa looked like so that I could create um, this world. I had to like have my basis um, in order to just then create whatever it is I wanted to create. But I at least had that foundation um, in me. Whew, okay. And then to switch from... Um, one to the other that's a really hard question um hmm i think it boils down to voice right like and, and i think this is just um in general for every book or any, anything that you do it boils like what i mean by voice is 
what does it sound like the per like the person who is speaking whether it's like you know your omniscient narrator or like your main character what do they sound like and therefore what does the world feel like right um voice in young adult is very very different from voice in middle grade so you have to be able to like and again remember when i talked about like understanding tropes um, you have to understand sort of the conventions of the genre. And that's like a really fancy way of saying that you have to understand that if this is middle grade, you have to have a certain amount of word count. Like you can't go past a certain word count. Voices tend to sound a certain way. And there are certain things that you cannot do in middle grade, right? So you have to understand the conventions of that um, age category um, versus young adult. And that's the way that you move in between. And like, what helps is reading a lot um, in, you know, cause like, oh, that's the other thing is like, I have touchstones like for um, YA books. I, I don't know, like for me, YA books are sort of instinctual, but for middle grade books, I have um, certain books that I will read and reread over and over and over and over again when I'm trying to get my mind into that middle grade world. Because like, there's a certain, bounce there that's necessary um that you can't like do in young adult and all that so yeah uh and going along with the questions about writing what has been the most surprising thing in your writing process or writing journey okay so surprising thing in my writing process and i'm deeply ashamed to admit this um I'm very ashamed. All right, so like, here's the thing. Like for me, um, if my first 50 pages aren't good, like, okay, I actually spend double the time um, on my first 50 pages than I do everything else. So like, say I'm writing a novel and I have like two months, I will spend one month on the first 50 pages and then the other month on the entire rest of the book. And that is my process. And it's it's really stupid and it's really silly, but it is what it is. And it, it took me a long time to realize that I actually can't do anything about that. It's so silly. Why can't I be better? But that that is what it is. And then in terms of like um, writing as a whole, like first of all, I didn't realize that it takes like around three years to get from publicate from writing the book to publication. There's so many people involved, so many moving parts. Oh, and that's the other thing is like, as a writer, you're not actually solitary. You know, like there's this whole idea of like, we're solitary and we like live alone and we write in like, no, like you have critique partners, you have like all these different people. Um, so you are only as good as your community when you're a writer. So find good critique partners um, and people to help guide your writing because you can't do it alone. Yeah. So I think we probably have time for one more question. And to wrap it up, maybe um, if you could describe the Gilded Ones in one word or just like one elevator pitch for people as to why they should read it, which they should, what would that be? Okay, I can, okay I'll do a word and an elevator pitch. So word, uh, brutal, um, all the content warnings. Um, this is a deeply violent book. It's hopeful, it's fun, but it's a violent book. Um, all right, so pitch. Um, so in uh, uh, The Gilded Ones is a young adult fantasy set in a deeply patriarchal world um, where there's a group of girls who are considered demons because they're faster and stronger than regular people and they bleed gold. Then, da, 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 actual demons come into the world and like, everybody's like, wait a minute, we actually sort of need these girls to fight these monsters and hopefully they'll kill each other off. So they give the girls a choice, fight or die. My main character, Deka, decides to fight and in doing so goes on an adventure that changes her whole life. Whew, there we go. Perfect. Um, you guys should definitely check the book out if you haven't already. Michelle and I both really enjoyed it. It is yeah, a lot ebook, audiobook, and hard copy at Boston Public Library, um, or you can go to your local indie bookstore.
but thank you Namna so much for joining us we hope you guys enjoyed this as much as we did if you're interested in other BPL teen events on April 1st you can join us on our Twitch channel um, to talk to the voice actor who did the Tristan Strong novels and then on May 13th we'll be back here on Zoom with Brittany Morris so check those out at bpl.org slash events um, but thank you all for joining us thank you thank you so much Namina. Thank you for having me. This has been so much fun. Um, and thank you guys for coming. All right. Bye, everyone. Have a good Bye afternoon. Guys. Bye.